Hi everyone, it's Nick. Welcome, welcome back to my channel. Okay, in today's video, we are going to be talking about interior design mistakes making your home look cheap. 10 mistakes, in fact. We're talking about how to make your home not look cheap. Okay, and now maybe usual disclaimer, because everybody otherwise goes crazy in the comment section. Do what you want, don't listen to this guy, blah, 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 blah. Cool, 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 no one cares. Maybe you like being cheap and gross, in which case, put these things in your home. As always, I don't live there. So go ahead and go nuts, like go have fun. But I'm sitting here making a video and you're here watching it. So we're just gonna have fun with this topic. Personally, I don't want my home to look cheap and I don't think you do either and that's why you clicked on the video. So let's talk about 10 things making your home look cheap. So let's get to it. When it comes to purchasing home decor and furniture, shopping can get pricey, especially if you have tastes like mine. Um, and that's why I'm all about getting a great deal. And that's why I love today's sponsor, which is Surfshark. Surfshark is an app and browser extension that allows you to change your online location without actually having to physically change your location. Toggling on Surfshark's VPN removes websites ability to show you prices based on location on device. So by removing any browser cookies the company used to try and make things more expensive, you can feel more confident in making your purchase. Also, so when snooping around for the best deal, you know that Surfshark will keep your information encrypted so that anyone who tries to view it won't be able to. They'll also keep you protected from any sort of sketchy websites that appear to have that piece of furniture for a real steal, but are really just there to actually steal your data. There is actually no risk in trying out Surfshark for yourself. Uh, they have a free 30-day money-back guarantee, so honestly, if you don't like it, you can always just cancel. You can do what you want there. So get those deals with Surfshark and enter coupon code Nick Lewis for an extra three months that you get absolutely free. So thank you, Surfshark, for sponsoring today's video and supporting the channel. Now let's Let's get back to things in your home that might making it look a little bit cheap. Okay, first one on my list is gonna be, I haven't talked about this in a long time, which is generic art in quotes. Okay, generic art, we've talked about it. And yet I still see it everywhere. We get it, We, we you have the Amsterdam photo from Ikea, 100%. Maybe you've got the one with the buffalo, whatever, with the bridge. Maybe these are, these are classic Ikea prints that we've seen a thousand times. And they just look that, they look generic, they look boring, they look like you don't care. Because you don't, because you don't, because that's why you chose it. Because you want to fill space, and I get it. You had a white wall and you're like, ah, I don't know what to do. Oh my God. Oh, Ikea. Oh, that's cute. I went to Amsterdam once. Let's throw that in there and make it look like I put that in. Do you know what I mean? Like you're trying to fill a space and I get that, but it really is making your space look cheap. And if you don't hear it from me, an anonymous person on the internet, then your friends aren't going to tell you. So that's why I'm here. It's not doing you any favors. You know what I mean? Like it just looks like you don't care because clearly you didn't when you bought this print. And look, maybe you can find something that fools people into thinking that it's really cool and maybe it is from Ikea on like the bottom shelf and no one's found it before. But the fact that it's in Ikea or Home Goods means based on manufacturing and price point that millions of people have this print. So, you know, it doesn't add anything to, just leave the wall blank if you don't want to put it. You know what I mean? And if you're like, ah, but it's like too expensive to buy real art, then save up for it or make it yourself. DIY it, don't. Like, or leave it blank. You don't necessarily have to fill space with garbage that isn't actually like interesting or unique or special because your home should reflect you because you're a wonderful, great person, I assume, because you're here on this channel. So you gotta be pretty good. You know, you're a nice person, you're a great person. So you deserve something better than cheap quotes and cheap art from Ikea. And so, you know, save up or make something yourself, thrift. There is thrift stores with so many prints that old ladies had and then unfortunately passed away and threw all their prints in Goodwill. And you know what? They've got some old photos there and things that you can actually repurpose for yourself. So go there, put that in. You know what I mean? That's way more unique. Maybe they've got old photos of their family that you don't even know their family. Maybe you want to use those photos. That can be creepy and fun at the same time. So maybe use those instead. And by the way, word art. We don't live, laugh, love it anymore. We never really did. And so now, this is being replaced with things that are a lot more interesting and special. So these aren't a substitute for personality. So I'd rather personally, 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 go for something that's a little bit more you and a little bit less like it's wine o'clock somewhere or whatever. I don't know, what beer o'clock somewhere? What are those stupid quotes? You know what I mean? Like there's all these things. I love drinking wine in the kitchen or whatever. Sometimes I even cook with it. Like these stupid quotes, these are stupid. Labeling kitchen, labeling dining, labeling wash in the in the bathroom. Like we don't need to do this anymore. Just, just, just move on, move on from this. Okay, next up on my list is gonna be cropped curtains. Cropped curtains. I did a TikTok once that was about cropped curtains and I think I got like 4 million views and most people thought that I was nuts and crazy and hated me and that's okay, that's fine. They say a lot of things over there on the tick tick. Crop curtains though are making your place look cheap and I think it's important for me to mention it. Listen, you've got a window and you decided you're like, okay, let's put your little little uh, little curtain rod there. And then you got these adorable little curtains that just barely cover the windowsill. And you thought that was a great idea. And I totally get it. You're covered the window. What are you talking about? You've got curtains over your window, you're done. But are you though? That's the thing. If you hang it a little bit higher, 
You're gonna hang the rod like a little bit higher. We're going really quite close to the ceiling there, right? And you're hanging them and they're going to the floor. That difference is going to make your space feel a lot more luxurious. It's gonna feel a lot more interesting. They're gonna have much more of a wow impact. And most importantly, it's gonna make your space feel taller, right? If you've got these little crop little curtains here, I mean, it's cute, but look, so you're gonna do like a cute little puppet show and not really actually curtains that are gonna be for a real life human. So taller curtains, things that go almost to the ceiling, they kiss the floor. There's a few different types of ways that you can do it. You can have them just kiss the floor. You can have them maybe puddle a little bit on the bottom. It's a little bit of a traditional look. It's a, it's a little heavy, but feel free to do something like that. But like get them to the floor and have them actually go and cover the entire window and actually really help kind of extend that window to make it feel a lot taller in the space. That's really what you're after, but these little short little crop little curtains there. Adorable as they are, they're making your space look a little bit cheap. By the way, the quality also matters there. So if they're those like sheer gauze ones or, oh my God, the ones that I had for years in my old rental apartment, which was the, like the fabric ones that were just like dust collectors. It was just like, you know what I mean? Like those little fabric ones and then you just like pull, oh God, those. I'll put a photo. Those were bad. Those were so, so bad. They're making your place look cheap because they're dusty as hell. So those things also aren't great. So maybe swap those out with something better. Okay, next up on my list is gonna be no texture. Texture. texture, I can see this all the time when I go to people's spaces. It's amazing how people don't understand texture and how it can really be a wonderful thing. I think they're really, it can create just really interesting spaces, especially if you're going like in the absence of color. I think color is a great way in order to add sort of personality and life and fun into a space. But if you don't love a lot of color, that's totally fine. Texture is gonna be your friend. But even if you do like color, fabulous, but also texture, you know, like have a little bit of fun with texture as well. And what I mean by that is the tactile feel of different things, different you know objects in your space, you know, whether that's going to be, you know, rugs or whether it's going to be a throw, whether it's going to be your pillows or it could be your bed or your bedding or, you know, window treatments, whatever. Adding interesting textures into a space, it makes it visually interesting because we know how things feel based on how they look. So you know, we know what stone feels like, we know what wood feels like, and it has a feel just by, you can feel with your eyes. Are you with me? You know what I mean? You're feeling with your eyes when you walk into a space. So if everything is flat and boring and blah, it, it just looks cheap. It looks cheap and it doesn't look interesting. And again, this isn't about money because I can tell you an acrylic throw or something from Ikea is gonna, is gonna do the job and it's cheap. Like it, there's a lot of stuff in there that's actually inexpensive, but it's not, cheap and flat, you know, whatever boring objects in a space all the time, it just feels like it doesn't have any depth in its design. And I personally just think adding a lot of texture, and again, texture doesn't have to be soft textural things. Brick is a wonderful texture. Like it, it creates something that just feels visually interesting. And it is more than just sort of, you know, colors living in your space or objects living in your space, but instead they sort of have a life and they have sort of a tactile feel to them. And that, to be honest, is a huge difference in making a space feel a lot more luxurious and higher end. So, you know, I would say, again, parking money for a second, it's still really wonderful to find um, objects that have texture in your space to create something that feels really interesting. And when I walk into a space and everything is flat and glossy and hard, it's just not interesting. Okay, next up on my list is gonna be one overhead light in your space. And we've talked about lighting. Of course, we're talking about lighting. And oof, the one overhead light, the one boob light, right? I mean, we could talk about boring lighting for sure. Of course, boring lighting, you know, the boob light is obviously gonna make your space look cheap because again, see generic art point one, you clearly don't care about lighting. And again, lighting is like the easy, is one of the easiest things that is relatively inexpensive to get something more interesting. Like, yes, you can go get, a, you can go buy a boob light, which now that I just thought of this, I'm like, who buys a boob light? Like they just appear in the wild, you know? Like no one actually, I don't think anybody's ever gone out to a store and bought a boob light. Like I think they just happen. Like builders obviously use them because they buy them for like eight cents a piece or something and install them in everybody's homes. But listen, interesting lighting isn't that expensive. Amazon's got some great ones. I'm gonna link to some below, some really great ones from Amazon. Like it's so easy, Wayfair, like it's so easy to get fairly inexpensive lighting, but also important to have different sort of lighting sources in your space. The one in the center of the room is not doing any justice. And it's also not just because it's whatever, boring lighting, but also because it just creates down shadows into the rest of the space. It makes everything look 
blah. Because it's one light, it's not coming, you're not lighting your space dynamically throughout the rest of the room. You know what I mean? You're just getting one light in the center and it's just lighting from the top and it's not lighting from the sides. It's not creating any shadow. Well, it's creating a lot of shadow. It's creating like one big shadow at the bottom. It's not creating interesting shadows in the space, which you're gonna get if you're so, if you have like a floor lamp and then you've got like a desk lamp and then you maybe have some accent lighting and then you have some recess lighting and then you maybe have a light in the center of the room. If you so choose, you don't even need to do that. You've got lots of multiple lighting sources and it's creating a dynamic flow in the rest of your space. It's gonna look a lot more interesting. When I go in, not only is am I gonna think it's cheap just looking at that one ugly boring light, but also it makes everything else in your space look boring. So even if you do all these other wonderful things in your space and you buy really expensive items, that one light sitting in the center is just making everything look cheap. Not good. Okay, next up on my list is gonna be everything too small. Really what we're talking about here is scale. We're talking about scale and proportion. The amount of, I, okay, I'm thinking art. I'm thinking rugs, right? Things that are really small for obvious reasons, materials, blah, 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 are going to be cheaper than large items. Again, rugs and art being the two that are really coming to mind for me right now, but it's true for everything, right? Like an oversized lighting fixture is gonna be a lot more expensive, not just a little bit more expensive, usually a lot more expensive than a much smaller light, right? So smaller things tend to be a lot cheaper. And so rather than getting the right size of something, people tend to get the one that is there and that makes the space look really, really cheap. And I'm sorry if you can't, like for example, let's take a rug. Choosing a really small, tiny rug in the center of the room that is obviously comically too small for your space, not only will your friends make fun of you behind your back, but also it's just gonna look like, it's just like a little postage stamp in the center of the room. It's not gonna do you anything. You're looking for rugs that are going to have the front two legs for sure on the front of the rug. That's great for apartments. It's great for smaller spaces. And if you have a really big Big, gorgeous, beautiful, wonderful, open concept space, and you've got a fabulous, wonderful living room, you may want to consider putting all of the legs on top of the rug. That's a little bit more of a luxe look or whatever, but you don't have to. You can just do the front two legs. That's what I do in this place because it's a smaller apartment. It's a two bedroom. So for me, that lot makes sense. But choose a rug that is the right size for the room that is going to have those front two legs because if you choose something too small, it's going to appear really, really cheap. And I think it's just better to choose to save up and get something that's the right size for the space that you actually have. If you really are just like, no, Nick, that's impossible. I can't possibly afford it. Totally get it. Consider layering multiple rugs. You know, considering, you know, if you want to go for something a little bit more eclectic, a little bit more funky, you can work with a couple of rugs there. But I think that a really solid rug just becomes, it's the platform in which the rest of the space sort of kind of lean, it's, it's, it's the anchor point for the whole home. Really just anchors all of your furniture pieces for the entire space. So I would consider that art, same idea. Okay, if you've got a big giant wall and you have a little tiny dinky little art piece on there, I mean, it oftentimes can appear really comically small. People oftentimes, solve this problem by doing a gallery wall, which is fine, but sometimes they don't do gallery walls correctly and they're not particularly interesting and they just look a little bit boring and blah. And I did a video on gallery walls if you wanna check that out. But I personally would say, if you want to go for something a little bit more luxurious, choose a larger scale art piece that's actually going to fit the space that you have. So it's really going to be in proportion for the rest of the wall. It's gonna be the right scale for the rest of the room. That is what you're looking for when talking about art pieces. Now, again, cluster into something like a gallery wall that is interesting and dynamic and cool is probably a good alternative or leave the wall blank. If you're really like, I don't really know what to do and I can't afford to do anything on that wall, rather than put a really small, comically small art piece, rather just keep it empty. Okay, next up on my list is gonna be shiny, glossy uh, plastic foil surfaces. Okay, we talked about this a little bit with texture, but I'm gonna just talk about it again in terms of like furniture pieces. The like plastic foil, sort of board that you see all the time. It sometimes could be like, you could take it as Ikea wood. That sort of really sort of glossy, cheap wood that you can see in coffee tables. You can see it in media consoles. It, if you're generous, you would call it a veneer, but really, you know, it's it's this just this plastic foil. That's basically what it is. And it sits on top of the, you know, particle board, fiber board stuff. Kitchen cabinets, right? Ikea uses a lot of this type of material in a lot of their wood wood stuff that they have in their own, in their showrooms. I think it's fine to lean on these a little bit. I, I totally get it. Like, I'll be honest, like there has been times when I have had those in my home and they have totally worked in a pinch and I super get it. But I think being careful to use it a lot can sometimes feel really cheap. And I would just say that you're better off mixing some of these pieces, which again, can be a great savings because they're usually 
quite inexpensive because they're often mass produced and, and available at retailers like Target and Ikea and things. You know, mixing those in with other pieces, maybe that are vintage, maybe that are just like, that have a little bit more texture. They're a little bit, you know, more some kind of honest materials as opposed to something that really reads as very sort of fake. Again, this also speaks to just the hard surface that you're gonna have in this space. All these hard surfaces all over the place, really glossy, really cheap looking. I just think they don't really make a whole lot of, they, they just make your place look a little bit cheap. And I'm saying, you know, if you can find ways to mix in other furniture pieces into that, you can still use them, but maybe just use them a little bit more sparingly than having your entire house decked out in this stuff. I understand it's generally quite inexpensive, but you know, that doesn't mean you have to look cheap. You can still work it into other types of furniture and make it work and it'll it'll look quite nice. Okay, next up on my list, I actually debated on this one, I even putting this one in, but I had to, and that was gonna be cheap flooring. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I mean, the reason I'm sorry is because there's oftentimes, it's tricky for people to swap this out. So if you see yourself in this next section, I apologize to you because it's not easy to swap out flooring and I recognize that. This is a fixed element. It is very disruptive to change it out. It's not like changing out a coffee table, right? It's not like changing out the light, the boob light, right? This is a lot more involved. It's probably a project that people do, you know, maybe once every seven years, right? It's something that people don't do very often because it's disruptive and it's expensive, but cheap flooring. I have to mention it because it's a video on things that are making your house look cheap and your flooring might be making your house look cheap. So I have to say it, right? I have to point it out. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about a lot of laminate flooring and a lot of lower grade sort of luxury vinyl planks. Now I am personally of the mindset, I'm not an absolute purist, although I love engineered hardwood. I love hardwood floors, personally. I love the texture, I love the wood grain, I like the look and feel. To me, I know the difference, I can see the difference. But I understand that for some people, for, for practical purposes, maybe you've got dogs, maybe you've got you know kids, maybe you've got it, LVP or something might make sense. Luxury vinyl plank might make sense. If Let's say you're doing an Airbnb, let's say you're doing a rental property, let's say you're looking for something that is going to be very durable and last basically forever, I get it. But that doesn't stop it from looking a little bit cheap sometimes. Laminate generally has sort of a screen printed sort of wood grain, so it's not actually wood grain, it's like a printed grain that kind of looks like wood if you squint. Luxury vinyl plank, of course, is basically, it's vinyl, it's basically plastic, and meaning it's very durable and it's water resistant and all the things, waterproof even, but you know, it's fake mimicking wood. So again, if you use your imagination, it kind of looks like wood. These are fine choices, but sometimes they are making your place look cheap, right? They just they just kind of are, right? A lot of laminate tends to wear in time and look really scuffed, and you can really start to see that it is just a printed on version, and that's when that wear isn't really gonna be great over the long term. And the challenge sometimes with a lot of vinyl plank is that it looks like vinyl plank, and it doesn't actually look like real wood, it doesn't resemble real wood really, and you know, it's it's a it's a fake version of a real like natural material which is always going to be my personal preferred choice and it's always going to be the more luxurious choice in my opinion you know real natural materials that actually come from nature remember her those are always going to be looking in my opinion a lot more expensive and luxurious so again i apologize because ugh, you, last year you just put in that luxury vinyl plank and you're like oh my god but it looks amazing and then you're like wait but this jerk's telling me that it looks crap and cheapy in my house you know i get it don't change it out out, but I have to mention, you know, it might make your place look cheap. If it looks that grayed out version, if it looks really unnatural, if you can tell that it's not real wood, it might be making your place look, look a little bit cheap. Not saying you have to do anything about it and invest in a good rug and let's just cover that up a little bit is maybe my answer to that one. Sorry. Okay, next up on my list is gonna be wimpy baseboards and casings. Sometimes it's a choice for people to use like no, you know, depending on your design style, right? Like a lot of, you know, Japandi or Japanese Zen spaces, uh, they might not use a baseboard at all. So, you know, obviously this is a little bit style dependent as is, you know, a lot of my advice on here. It depends on what you're trying to do. It's not a mistake if you intended to do it, you know, like if you don't think it's a mistake, then fine, then go ahead and do it. But I would say for most homes in North America, you know, you're probably gonna have baseboards, you're probably gonna have casings, right? And really cheap builder grade ones that are generic looking and usually really like wimpy and small, personally, in my opinion, usually look really cheap. And that's really just because it's a nod to sort of like builder grade cheap product. And that is personally just maybe making your place look a little bit cheap. And I, the reason I mentioned this one is not because you necessarily have to go and swap out all your baseboards, although maybe you might want to after seeing this, but also just because people might not be aware. You might be like looking around going like, why does my place just look a little bit? Uh, and then you're like, oh, 
actually upgrading your baseboards makes a massive difference, right? Choosing something with an interesting edge profile, choosing a flat stock, it doesn't really matter. But choosing a taller baseboard even can really be great, like a five inch or whatever. something that's a little bit taller, a little bit more substantial can really make a space look really beautiful. It's a small detail. It might not be something that you necessarily notice, but it does, I think, upgrade a space and make it look a lot better. Casings, we're gonna put it in the same category. Oftentimes those things are kind of treated and kind of done at the same time, right? So casings are very similar. It can absolutely make a big difference to upgrade those casings. And bonus, I would say, is, you know, really hollow, cheap doors also make a really big difference. Ugh, it's such a small detail people don't notice, but it's great for soundproofing. If you were to move to something like a solid core door, it's going to be great for soundproofing. So you you know you're able to kind of live in home, you live in your house without anybody necessarily hearing what everybody's doing behind doors. You know it can really make a big difference. It feels a lot more solid when you're actually you know closing your door, opening your door. You can actually feel it. It's a heavier door, and that's because it's a solid core. The interior of the door is going to be really just solid wood, as opposed to hollow core doors, which are fine, but those really flimsy, sort of plasticky ones that you like tap on them and they kind of like ring out like a gong. Yeah, those ones. Those ones are a little bit cheap and they're making your space feel a little bit cheaper. Again, some people might not notice. I hate being the bearer of bad news though, which is that I'm gonna notice. And um, well, it's my video, so that's why I'm putting it in this list. Okay, next up on my list is gonna be matching everything. Matching everything perfectly. I know, it's like, but Nick, it's you said it's supposed to be cohesive and now you're telling me I can't match everything. Make up your mind, you're making no sense. I hear you, I get it. But here's what I mean by that. We're looking for things that are sort of like related, but not necessarily matchy-matchy, right? We want them to sort of, of not be like twins, but something that are just like, okay, I can see where you're going with that. There could be similar in color, it could be similar in texture, it could be similar in style, right? You're, you're thinking of things that don't necessarily, you're not so much repetition in some of your choices that you're making in your space, but they might speak to each other in that way. And I think sometimes people get really caught up in cohesive that they get a little bit matchy-matchy. And that's where they choose sort of copy-paste jobs all around. Now, it's really sometimes I think difficult for people to recognize when to use repetition as a tool in design to create a cohesive space versus when it looks too matchy-matchy. So a good example of repetition might be something like, let's say you got three bar stools in your kitchen. You might have three bar stools at the island. You, you might, it probably makes sense that it's kind of intuitive to us to choose three of the same bar stools. Of course you would. That just makes sense, right? Three bar stools, that's fine. They should all match. But then when you go to go do your side chairs, you're like, so then why can't I have a couch and a sofa and another side chair and my two ottomans and everything be exactly super matchy-matchy? It's like, well, because those are gonna be different elements in the space, right? So rather than having sort of this repetition of these three bar stools, which is fine, when you're actually just matching all of your side chairs and all of your couches and your bedroom suite, because you got the dresser from the same collection as the nightstands, as the bed, as the whatever, there's no depth to the design. It's not interesting. And those are different things. It's fine to have two nightstands that are matching. That's fine. But when the nightstand and the dresser and the bed matches, it's too much matchy-matchy. You get what I'm saying? It's fine to match some colors in the room, especially for things that are related pieces. But you also want to incorporate the tints, tones, and shades of all those different colors and kind of create a really nuanced and interesting color palette. And so when I walk into a home and everything is like that same, like, navy pillow and you're just like oh wow you just use the exact same navy pillow over and over and over again and every little cushion has a cute little navy <laughs> it's like that's adorable but it's reading is a little bit too matchy matchy i think and it just looks a little bit cheap have a little bit of fun you know what if you, you de clearly define your color palette sit down and figure out okay i want i want blues but i want different shades and different tints tones and shades of blue and i also want to incorporate some brown i want to have some cream and i want to you know create your color palette and then you go out and you start to source things like your you know, pillows and all those different wonderful furnishings and things. And then you can start to pull in those different colors from the palette. That's really important. By the way, shameless plug, I have a course on all this. You can feel free to check it out. But that's really what's important here. We're not so matchy-matchy. We're finding things that are related. And I think that makes the place feel a lot more interesting and therefore not as cheap as it does when everything matches. Okay, the number 10 on my list is going to be too much open shelving. Too much, okay, we talk, it's like, it's the trend that is around forever is the too much open shelving, but I don't just mean open shelving. I should actually clarify. I just mean putting out so much of your stuff that ought not to be put out, that it should not, that shouldn't be displayed. You know what I mean? Consider, consider, you don't have to do, you don't have to do any of this, but consider hiding or storing or getting rid of things that you don't really need anymore or those practical things 
things that you do need, like, you know, like the TV remote or whatever, consider putting them in a place that's not so cluttered. Now, some people, you know, people have mentioned that they're just like, Nick, if I put the remote in a drawer, I'll forget where it is. And uh, that's totally fine. I get that, in which case, fine. The remote is a tool that you need all the time in the space. So maybe you use it in your home. That's fine, fine, fine. But like some things you don't have to necessarily have as open shelving because I think it just makes your space feel really cluttered. And these open media consoles just, and arguably any of the over cluttered bookshelves and the whatever, it just makes your place feel really drab. And I think in my personal opinion, look a little bit cheap. Closed drawer systems, what they can do for you is they hide a lot of the things that make a space feel visually cluttered. So I'm not necessarily talking about getting rid of everything, although feel free to edit your space and get rid of stuff you don't need anymore because we all have too much crap we need to get rid of, but hiding the stuff that you maybe do need that you don't wanna see anymore. So like. It's fine to have a PlayStation 5. Go for it, that's great. I have one too. But does it need to be on display? You know what I mean? Do you need to necessarily have it there with the glowing lights 24 seven? If you're able to hide it in a way that, you know, ventilates your electronics so that they don't break down. But like, if you're able to sort of hide it in between use, I think it makes a much better impact in your space because it just clo it just closes things up because these, these electronics and these things are not particularly attractive. So I would say it sort of cheapens your home to have everything out on display. If you have a couple of things on display, that's fine. Just take the minute to be intentional about what you're choosing to display. That's really it. I'm not telling you what you should or shouldn't. I'm not saying what is ugly and what isn't ugly. Well, I kind of am, but like, I'm not really telling you, like you can make up your own mind on what you want to display and what not to. Just be mindful of it. It, right? Just look around your space and go, you know what? That is actually kind of hideous. Maybe I should cover it up. In which case, you know, buy a little unit and you can just throw a little door over it and you're good to go. That's what I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so that's it for me for today, guys. I hope you really enjoyed this video. I'm gonna link here actually to the video that I did on the number one interior design mistake where I go at length talking about open shopping. So if you enjoyed that number 10 on my list, I think you'll really enjoy that video. So thank you all. I'll see you all in the next video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.